Um, let's talk a little bit about review from yesterday, okay? Uh, before we do that, though, let me pray for us. God, you are good and you are gracious. And in your grace and in your mercy, you, you provide answers uh, to our toughest questions. If you are big enough to handle our confusion and you give us um, a, a clear way to understand. You may not explain everything, but you give us what we need. And so, Father, I pray today as we wrestle, we would wrestle well uh, with your truth. I pray that we would see these answers as good because you are good and you are the one who gave them. And um, help us to trust you and believe you in that. Uh, Give us insight, give us clarity uh, as we open your word. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, yesterday uh, we talked about, this is sort of a review. Yesterday we talked about gender and uh, identity and sexuality in terms uh, of talking uh, about sort of two different religions. we got two different religions uh, that are sort of competing for the hearts uh, and the minds within our culture, uh, Christianity and secularism. And the two conflicting stories that these two religions tell about truth, about God, God, uh, about the world, about human beings, uh, and about how we should live, ultimately play into what they're saying about gender identity and sexuality. And so first we looked at the Christian story uh, and what Jesus had to say about gender identity and sexuality in light of the story of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. How in the first two chapters of the Bible we see God's design for the way things are supposed to be uh, with regards to sexuality. One man, one woman, in marriage, for life. However, in chapter 3, this perfect creation falls into rebellion and sin, leading human beings to engage in sexuality contrary to God's perfect design in the first two chapters. And so in the Christian story, in the Christian story, there's a difference between the way things are and the way things are supposed to be. Okay? In other words, just because there are some various forms of sexuality going on, that does not necessarily mean that they are good. Now, the secular story tells a different story about this. Uh, it's articulated in the song, Lady, uh, Born This Way, Lady Gaga. Uh, there's no fall in secularism. And so human beings are essentially born good, and so with regards to like sexuality, gender identity, they can trust their impulses. They can trust their instincts to be good as well. They're, that's what's telling them what's true in this story. And so God makes no mistakes. We are born this way. But what I wanted to leave you with, I hope this was the, the, the ultimate takeaway yesterday, was that the Christian story is more than just the way things are supposed to be uh, versus the way things are. If all the Christian story offers to us is God's perfect standard and our failure to meet that standard, then we should not be surprised when people struggling with homosexuality or gender identity say to us, you know, thanks, but um, well, no thanks. In fact, if all the story is is creation and fall, then, then we probably shouldn't stick around either. Um, because there's really not any hope for us in it either. Not one single person uh, in this room, on this planet, is experiencing the beautiful ideals of Genesis chapter 1 and 2. The playing field of humanity has been leveled. Okay, And we're all in this boat together. And the good news is, though, that's not the whole story. There's more to this story. And with regards to the more to this story, we're going to spend some time on that tomorrow. Okay? I want to spend more time today talking about the fall. And the reason I want to do that is not because I just want to sort of, you know, talk about negative things and all that, but because if we're going to say, and I hope you heard me say this, um, if we're going to say that various forms of sexuality are not part of God's good creation, but part of the fall, and if we're going to talk about gender identity, and just to be clear, I want to kind of explain, make sure we know what we're talking about here. Um, this idea of gender identity is feeling that your biological sex, sex refers to like biology, okay, anatomy type stuff. If you feel different from that, that doesn't line up, uh, then we're talk, that's what it means to talk about gender identity. So we, we're familiar with kind of the Bruce Jenner, the Caitlyn Jenner type stuff. Um, that's exactly what we're talking about here. You feel that, that, that your gender is different than your biological sex. Okay? And what we're saying with that, though, is that that is part of the fall. Okay? That's not the way that God designed it uh, to be. Okay? And so, given that we're dealing 
with real people, we want to make certain that we have this topic well because I want to be really careful about what we are saying and what we're not saying with that. Okay? I've entitled today's talk as What Does It Mean to Be a Sinner? Okay? If you've been around the church long enough, you've heard the church talk about sin. You know, Romans 3, for all sin, and all short of the glory of God. Uh, and, and so we're familiar with this. But as I listen to people talk about being a sinner, sometimes it, it just it feels like something's missing. Okay? Not to, not to borrow sharp jokes from Joey, but, but let's, let's, let's borrow one just for a second. Let's go to the beach for a second. Look, we're going out to the beach. If, if, if all of a sudden the lifeguard came up to you and said, Hey guys, there's a shark over there. Shark. Shark. Yes, yeah, it's, it's coming. Hey people, get out. Get out. Come on. Come on. Hey, your, your, your leg's bleeding. Come on. Um, come on. Get out. Get on the water. If, 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 if the message is conveyed that way, would you really take the threat very seriously? I, I don't think so. And it's the same way when, when I hear people describe themselves as sinners sometimes, I almost wonder, do you really even care? Like, does it bother you? Because it doesn't really sound like that big of a deal to you. Sometimes being a sinner sounds more like inconvenient than, than, you know, that I have violated my relationship with the Creator of the universe, that I am broken and rebellious and tainted. Uh, that, that, it doesn't sound devastating at all. It sounds inconvenient. Um, and now, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble, guys. We're all kind of just going to get wild here. Um, yeah, there you go. Out of order. We're going to be okay. Um, and so what exactly are we saying when we say that we're sinners? If there's one passage in the Bible that paints this picture of humanity's plight into sin like no other, that's Romans chapter 1. Romans is a very interesting letter uh, because unlike Paul's uh, other letters, Paul planted a lot of churches. So Paul knew all of these people when he was planting these churches, uh, these letters he's writing. He does not know, he didn't plant the church at Rome. He does not know these people. And so he's writing to this church uh, to make certain that they get the gospel. He wants to spell out the gospel in very clear terms. That's why we love the book of Romans because Paul is just like, here it is. Here's the gospel. Okay? Do you understand who Jesus is and what He's done? I'm going to make certain you do. Now, in Paul's presentation of the Gospel, Paul is not content to simply say, Hey God, we, no, we, we all realize we're sinners, right? We, we get that. Alright. All right. Now I'm going to just kind of gloss over that and talk about how awesome Jesus is. Jesus is great. Let's talk about Jesus. Okay? He does not do that. Paul instead gives us three chapters of tremendous insight on the nature of sin, indicting all of humanity for its sinfulness, and then going into great detail on how this sinfulness plays itself out in practice. But not only that, Romans 1 is a passage that we must deal with if we want to understand what the Bible teaches on the topic of sexuality in particular. Okay? It's one of those passages that discusses homosexuality at length. If you want to be a Christian and understand what the Bible says about homosexuality, you've got to wrestle with Romans 1, bottom line. All right? And so we're going to talk through Romans chapter 1 today. We're going to read through uh, uh, verses 18 through 32. Okay? In Paul's discussion of Romans chapter 1, he's going to say at least three things that are common to all of humanity. Okay? Every single human being. And he's going to say some really harsh things, guys. He's going to sound like he's talking about, like, the worst people, the Nazis. Okay? Here's the thing. Paul is talking about every single human being on the planet. All of humanity. I'm going to keep reminding you of that as we go through here. Okay? So three things that Paul says about all of humanity. The number one, that all of humanity, everyone, all people know God. There's your blank. All people know God. Romans 1, 18-20. For the wrath of God is being revealed against all godliness and all unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Who's them? Who's them? Humans. Humans. Every single human being on the planet. Because God has shown it to them. Who's them? Humans. All of us. Okay. So... 
For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they... Who, who's they? Just one more time. Humans, all of us, all of humanity, are without excuse. Okay, All of us are without excuse. Okay, Oftentimes, um, this is pretty common... You'll hear people talk about being a Christian. Like, what does it mean to be a Christian? How do I describe that? Um, you'll hear people talk about that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a pause real quick. Because Stephen is back with some more sheets. If you need a top sheet or a second sheet, here's your man right here. Okay? Who needs a top sheet right now? Pat, yeah. All right. Awesome. Who needs a second sheet? I'll, t- I'll, t- I'll take care. I'll, t- I'll take care of it. Second sheet. Life is good. Get up on this, uh, yeah. Learn to share, people. Learn to share. Alright, I'm concerned that I'm going to lose you. Very, very narcissistic. Y'all stay with me. Alright, sometimes when you hear people talk about what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? You'll hear people say, being a Christian means having a relationship with God. We've heard this language before. What does it mean? Having a relationship with God. Okay, and here's the thing, guys. I don't want to pick your words apart. I don't want to split hairs. Um, but the Bible really doesn't talk that way. I know what you mean. It's fine. If you just whatever. Keep using it if you want to. But, but, but the Bible doesn't talk that way. Because um, here's the thing. God made all people, right? He made all people in His image. And all people live on His planet. And all people are accountable to Him. And so here's the thing. Everybody has a relationship with God. Every single human being has a relationship with God. The question is not, do you have a relationship with God? The question is, do you have a right relationship with God? Do you have a restored relationship with God? And everybody knows God as far as Romans 1 is concerned. However, though everyone... It may be deep, deep, deep down... Because verse 18 tells us that we suppress the truth uh, in righteousness. Everybody has that relationship with God. So number one, all people know God. Number two, we all suppress that knowledge. We all suppress that knowledge. Uh, I I chose wrongly this week uh, when I put my bed right beside the air conditioner. Because the guys I'm I'm rooming with want to put it down to like 45 degrees. uh, And that's fine, whatever. Um, But, you know, because you want to take care of the person at the back of the room because they don't want to, you know, swelter over in the the heat. But but if you're sleeping by the air conditioner, you're just going to breathe in 45 degrees of air all night long. And you're going to wake up with like maybe a little bit of a cough, okay? Uh, A hacking cough. And so in those moments, I am a high-maintenance diva, whatever. Um, Bottom line is when I've got the cough, off, I'm going to go to the drugstore and I'm going to go get some cough suppressant. I'm going to go push that thing down. Suppressant means to get rid of it, to push it away. That's what the word suppress means. Push it down. Okay? To get rid of it, to push it aside. Okay? And so Paul is saying here that we, all of humanity, we see the knowledge of God. We see God everywhere. His fingerprints are all over this creation. If you saw the water yesterday uh, at the beach, just gorgeous. Okay? Some, it, do I, I wasn't here last year. It was nasty. Filled with See that there is a God. Um, <laughs> terrible, um, terrible joke. But the the beauty of creation. God's fingerprints are all over this. Psalm nineteen. Okay, the heavens declare the glory of God. Creation itself is giving evidence to the fact that there is a God. But people look at that and they push it away. They suppress it. We're supposed to know God, but in our sinfulness, in our brokenness, we push this away. Okay, I'm going to take what I know about God and I'm going to convince myself that it is not true. Here's my question to you. Is that a conscious thing that we do? Do we do that willfully? Do we do that knowingly? I'm going to, I'm going to knowingly push what I know about God. I'm going to knowingly suppress that. I'm not sure. Let's look at verse 21. Perhaps we do sometimes. The verse 21 says, Although people knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts became darkened. 
Our thinking and our hearts are involved here. Okay, Both our thinking and our hearts are suppressing our knowledge of God. And while there may be times where we go, an intentional time where we do that, and we knowingly do that, I don't think that that's always the way it is. What I hear Paul saying here, and here's your blank, Paul is describing more of a sinful condition than a willful decision. Paul is speaking about our brokenness as a humanity, our rebellious brokenness. To be clear, we're we're responsible here, but this is a sinful condition rather than a willful decision. Okay? Alright? There's more, I'm not saying we're not responsible, but there's more involved here than just our wills. Alright? The nature of sin, guys, is so much more than just doing bad things. Okay? Our hearts are involved here. It's the condition of our hearts. And so here's a question that we need to think through. Are we sinners because we sin? Or do we sin because we are sinners? Are we sinners because we sin? Or do we sin because we sinners? Now what's the the right answer? Okay, We sin because we are sinners. In the Christian story, being comes before doing. Okay, Being comes before doing. All right, because here's the thing. If, if you're a sinner because you sin, then what do you need to do to stop being a sinner? Stop sinning. Stop it. Stop it. Um, stop sinning and you're no longer a sinner. Problem solved, right? Um, in this scenario, at our core, we're actually kind of pretty good people who, who may do the occasional bad thing. That is not the picture the Bible paints, okay? Alright? Sin is much, much deeper than the things that I do. My sinfulness is wrapped up in who I am, in my nature, in my thoughts, in my feelings. That's why Richie last night, he prayed uh, about you know what we do in word, thought, word, and deed. Okay? Sins of omission, sins of commission, that kind of stuff. All right? Now, the stuff in my heart, it, it, it comes out. Okay? It shows up in the terrible, horrible, awful things that we do to each other, uh, the selfish and rebellious things that we do. More on that in a moment. But that stuff starts here. And I think it's really, really important, guys, to understand what this means in light of gender, identity, and sexuality. One of the arguments that I, I, we used to hear a lot more on this topic, less so now, was that homosexuality was just a choice that people made. Okay? People just choose to be gay. People just choose to, to have questions regarding their, uh, their, their gender identity. Okay? And so what people need to do is just stop it. Stop it. Okay? Stop choosing to be gay. Stop choosing to have those thoughts. Okay? Now, do we believe as Christians that we choose to be sinful? Do we believe that? Okay? Now, you, to be good, you may do you may choose to do sinful actions, but do you choose to be sinners? Think for about just for a moment. The, 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 the sin that just plagues you. The sin that just weighs so heavily on you. The sin that you just can't seem to shake. Did you just one day kind of wake up and decide to do that? Or to to feel that? Did you one day just decide to feel that? Okay, you know what? I'm going to be selfish from now on. Yes. That, yes. That's what I want to do. And so to me, guys, it's just baffling to me that Christians who claim to be that Jesus talks about the fact that sin comes out of the heart and then shows up in the actions, and we'll acknowledge this on so many different topics, but on this topic, on this topic, on this particular issue, it's just a matter of your will. Stop it. Stop it. Now, there's a lot of debate, guys, on uh, what causes a person to have same-sex attraction in terms of like sort of the secondary causes for us. You know what's going on in, on this planet that, that might you know affect that, um, or experience confusion with regards to gender identity. So this could be, is this a genetic re- Is there the gay gene? Is the gay gene out there and that's affecting us, or or is it biological? Something's gone on with, with, with the body and something to do with our with our with, with our minds or whatever. Um, something psychological as we're sort of processing the world or whatever. Uh, perhaps Perhaps this has to do with our, our experiences, okay? Maybe a person had an upbringing with uh, abuse or neglect or whatever. Uh, are, are these like social factors? You, you live in a, in a world right now.
right now that's, that's more sympathetic to that. And, and, and the worldview is shaping how people think. And so you're, you're, you're responding to that kind of stuff. All of these things are talked about by the smartest people in the world. I don't mean like just, just the Christian people that we, you know, we only want to listen to them, right? No, all the people in the world. And they're playing, playing, interacting with all of these different ideas. And they've all come together uh, and said, hey, we, we, we don't know. We don't know. We don't have a definitive... We, we may have an idea. This person may say, you know, this, the evidence kind of points to that a little bit. And so I'm like, well, what about this? And I mean, So there, there's constant debate and discussion. But as far as like a definitive answer, we can go, here it is. We don't have it. We don't have it. All right. In terms of secondary matters in terms of what's causing this in this fallen, broken world. But we as Christians can say this definitively. It's all due to the fall. It's all due to the fall. It's all due to our brokenness and our rebellion. And by the way, you need both. We need to have both up and running in our minds. Sin is not just active rebellion. Sin is brokenness too. Okay? When I asked this question last uh, uh, last session. When did you fall into sin? When did you fall into sin? Before you were conceived. Okay. Um, you want some other answers? Wait, we got that answer. Before you were conceived. What, what might be some other answers? First time you sinned. Okay. Early on. Um, yeah, you, you, that four-year-old, up, up until like age four, you were good. And then you sinned at four and now you're, you're in trouble. When did you sin? When did you fall into sin? The fall. Okay, I think that is the right answer. Go look at it. Please write this down, actually. Romans chapter 5, verse 21. Because Romans chapter 5, verse 21 talks about this whole thing that when Adam fell, you fell. He was our representative. And he did not nail it. Okay? And because of what he did, you've been affected by it. Were you at the fall? Like physically there? Were you there? No. But what Adam did, you are there is a real sense in which. There's a real sense in which you are a victim of the fall. You are a victim of it. You were not there. Adam totally messed this thing up for you. And yet, if you also keep reading uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 21, you are also a participant. It's both, guys. It's both. Victim and perpetrator. Okay? Broken and rebellious. They're both up and running. Okay? And so as we look around at this world, at the fallenness of this world, we experience brokenness. Okay? It's not actively... I've actively chosen to do something necessarily. I've actively, I'm actively sinning. You're experiencing brokenness. You're experiencing the effects of the fall. All of us are. And we're also doing bad things too. We have to have both categories up and running. Okay. So here's a question I want us to really think through for a second as we talk about this. Let's say they find the gay gene. They find it. They find the gay gene. And they find it in such a way that Christians have to like look at it and go... Man, we can't argue with that. It's not like the moon landing where still people are going, we never really landed on the moon. No, that's a bad joke, whatever. Um, We have to, like Christians have to like, yeah, yeah, there it is, there it is. Would that like totally undermine Christianity? Nope. It wouldn't. Because what we're saying is, is that if that happened right there, they're saying that our bodies are broken by what? The The fall. Okay? Are broken by the fall. Alright, so as we look about at this, we can't give, there's not a definitive secondary explanation, but there is a definitive explanation, and it's a spiritual condition. Okay? Alright, it's a spiritual condition that we have. But having rejected, this is number three now, having rejected the one true living God, that does not mean that we just stop worshiping. Doesn't mean we just stop worshiping. Okay? Number three, we are all worshipers. All of us know God, all of us suppress the truth, and all of us are worshipers. Last night, Richie quoted Augustine when he said that our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. You see, every single one of us, every single one of us, we're made for God, and if we've taken that God, if we've rebelled against Him, what that means is that we've got this giant hole in our in our in our souls. Okay. Bye, First Prince Meridian. See y'all. Peace out. Um, 
Anybody else want to go? No. Okay. Yeah. Just first Presbyterian. Um, rudest people, rudest church ever. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right, bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. Here's the point, guys. Every one of you has a, has a giant God-shaped hole and we are looking to fill it. We are looking for something to give our lives meaning and purpose, something that will give us satisfaction. Uh, and so we are by our very natures worshipers, okay? We have to, we are finite creatures that have to ha- attach ourselves to something uh, infinite, something that, that, that will give us meaning, okay? We can't not worship something. You're going to spend your time You're going to spend your effort. You're going to spend your money. You're going to spend your heart loving and pursuing something to make this life worthwhile in our broken state. Okay? It's inevitable. What's interesting is that you know the Bible doesn't talk you know, these languages these terms we use for being a Christian uh, you know having a personal relationship with God another one of those is accepting Jesus in your heart we know this stuff accepting Jesus in your heart the Bible doesn't use that language either it does use this though it talks about accepting idols into our hearts that we accept them into our hearts they kind of get inside of us and we attach ourselves to them so let's look at verses 22 to 25. Claiming to be wise, they... Who's they? Okay. They became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up... better way to put that is gave them over. Okay? He let us have what we want. Okay? He didn't give up on us. But He let us have what we want. He gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And there's a big fancy word for this. It's called idolatry. Okay? Idolatry. And the nature of idolatry, I'm looking for a definition, the nature of idolatry is kind of right there. To worship the creation rather than the Creator. Worship of the creation rather than the one who actually made it. Okay? So we try to find gods. And what we see here are, are you know, people trying to fashion gods. They're trying to make gods. They're trying to find something that they can bow down to. The whole birds and mortal man, animals, all that kind of stuff. We're going to try to create a God that, that, that we can represent right there. But this God looks like us. It looks like the things that God made. And so we're going to bow down to that. We're going to find a God that we like better. One that lets us do whatever we want. That's kind of what's going on with secularism. A God that we like a little bit better. A God made in our image. He looks like us. The problem with a God made in our image is He can't save you. Because He's too much like you and He doesn't even really exist. So we do that or we worship actual stuff. We look down and we see that person or that thing or whatever and we go after it. We try to fill that God-shaped hole with that thing that will give our lives meaning and give our lives purpose and that is idolatry. Alright, um... Now, there will be those who will look at um, what Paul talks about here and and sort of say, um, you know, I'm not really a worshiper. I don't worship. Because what do y'all think? When you hear the word worship, what do you think of? What do you think of when you think of worship? I think of like somebody like in a worship service. Okay? Maybe even, I grew up Baptist, so there's like the. You know, that kind of thing. Um, which is, that's fine if you want to do that. That's great. Um, but, but if you're a non-Christian and you see somebody doing that and that's what it means to worship, you're, you probably look at that and go, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I'd do that. I, I, don't, mean, um, I don't think so. Um, and, and so they think that and they go, well, yeah, I'm not a worshiper. And so this whole idea of like convincing people who aren't Christians about what the Bible says that every human being is a worshiper, that could be potentially a tough sell. Um, however, I remember, that, I remember very distinctly um, the first time I was riding in my car and I heard the song Take Me to Church. And I... <laughs> um, Take me to church! Uh, there you go. And I remember... Um, I remember being floored by it. And the reason I was floored by it was not because they were bad-mouthing Christianity. Um, y'all, we need, we need to get used to that, okay? If that shocks you still, uh, you, you need to prepare yourself. Um, I was 
I was shocked to hear someone who is not a Christian basically sing Romans chapter 1. What it is. Uh, totally unapologetically own up to exactly what the Bible says about idolatry. Let's look at the lyrics. My lover's got a hum- or got humor. She's the giggle at a funeral. Everyone knows dis- or, uh, everyone knows everyone's disapproval. I should have worshipped her sooner. If the heavens ever did speak, she's the last true mouthpiece. Every Sunday's getting more bleak. A fresh poison each week. We're born sick. You heard them say it. My church offers no absolute. She tells me worship in the bedroom. The only heaven I'll be sent to is when I'm alone with you. I was born sick, but I love it. Command me to be well. And he goes on and talks about the nature of sort of our church. Take me to church as he sees it. I'll worship like a dog at the shrine of your lies. I'll tell you my sins. You can sharpen your knife. Offer me that deathless death. Good God, let me give you my life. Um... And I hear that and I'm going... Now, if you know anything about the song, um, he wrote it as sort of a protest to the way that Christians understand homosexuality. Uh, and sadly, to our shame, have, have mistreated homosexuals throughout the centuries. Let's, just, let's own that, right? Uh, and as a result, it's become sort of an anthem for the LGBT movement. Um, However, it's become an anthem for pretty much anybody who's got issues with the church. I remember I went to the early service one one day and I was driving out of town and I drove through it and I heard it on the radio. It was about 11 o'clock. And, you know, I listened to it and I heard it again. And I heard it again. It was on repeat at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. They're saying something there. Um... I want to look at a description of what, how he describes the song, what, why he wrote the song, okay? And it's right there in front of you too. Sexuality and sexual orientation, regardless of orientation, is just natural. An act of sex is one of the most human things. But an organization like the church, say through its doctrine, would undermine humanity by successfully teaching shame about sexual orientation, that it's sinful or that it offends God. The song is about asserting yourself and reclaiming your humanity through an act of love. Turning your back on the theoretical thing, something that's not tangible, and choosing to worship or love something that is tangible and real, something that can be experienced. That last sentence right there is a great definition for idolatry. That's what we're saying. Okay? And now I would take issues on experiencing God and some of these other things. I think that God has shown His love uh, in a very tangible way. Jesus walking around here in flesh and blood, walking around and, and, and through an act of love, saving people in a very tangible and real way that we can't experience. Okay, so I would take issue with that. With that. But His talking about sex and the way uh, and idolatry here, it's exactly where Paul's going to go here for the rest of Romans chapter 1. Okay? What happens when we worship these false gods instead of worshiping the true God, is something happens inside of us. There are people who will make the statement, you know what, Just as long as you're worshiping something, that's your path, worship that religion, just worship something. The Bible could not be any more clear that that's a real problem. Because, and here's your blank right there, we become what we worship. We become like what we worship. To use the Lord of the Rings, the Schmeagol and the Ring, and he's I mean, he's good. Schmeagol turns into Gollum, and he's not you know because he's obsessed over something like that. We become what we worship. That's exactly what Tolkien was doing with that. All right, um, what we worship in our hearts is exactly what we become like in practice. All right, and so in verse twenty six, Paul shifts gears. Because he wants to talk about the practical effects of homosexuality. I'm sorry, the practical effects of idolatry, and he's going to say three things that I think we need to hear with regards to homosexuality. Okay, homosexuality in particular, less gender identity. We can talk more about that tomorrow. But he's really going after the topic of homosexuality here. Number one, Paul clearly states that homosexual behavior is part of the fall. Clearly. Verse 26. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Better way again to say that God gave them over. God did not give up on us. Uh, but He let human beings have what they wanted. Okay, and it says, For their women exchanged natural relations, natural uh, creation type stuff, 
For those who are contrary to nature, and men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Okay? That's pretty clear. Now there will be people who will try to make the argument. This is the argument that you'll hear. That, that what Paul's talking about right there is not sort of you know, the homosexuality that we see now. You know, two homosexuals, monogamous, and, and, and they're committed to one another. This sort of beautiful picture of love. Love wins. There, there it is. Paul, they're saying Paul's not talking about that. Paul is talking about like cultic sexual practices where you show up to the temple and you engage with a temple prostitute and all that kind of stuff. And Paul's saying we shouldn't do that. That's what Paul's talking about here. He's not talking about the homosexuality that we have. He's talking about that. The the real problem with that is, if Paul wanted to talk about that, he could have very easily talked about it. There was language for him to use to talk about that. In the same breath, if Paul wanted to talk uh, about the goodness of homosexual relationships, monogamous homosexual unions, if he wanted to talk about that, that was up and running too. This stuff didn't just get it. People will say, oh, that, this just started. They didn't have any concept of that. That's complete BS. Complete and total BS. Um, they totally knew about that. And But here's the thing. It doesn't really make it, that line of argument doesn't even really make any sense. Paul uses the term here, contrary to nature. We're back once again to creation, fall. Okay? And everything he says lines up with everything the rest of the Bible has said, the Old Testament even, okay? Paul is in the New Testament saying the exact same thing that the Old Testament says. All right? And, this is, and I want to point this out too. There's a lot, I talked about the shellfish thing yesterday. Oh, you eat shrimp, so chunk that Bible verse about homosexuality from Leviticus. Or you wear rayon and polyester, so I guess it doesn't count. Um, here's why that argument falls apart. Here's why it falls apart. Because Paul, in the New Testament, when he's talking to the church, echoes what the Old Testament says. Are there laws in the Old Testament that we don't keep anymore because we are Gentile Christians and because that was back and that was designed only for that time and place and because Jesus has fulfilled that aspect of the law? There are those things. But when Paul quotes or alludes to the Old Testament on an issue like this and says this still applies, and here's your blank, that's part of the moral law. Here's your blank. It's part of the moral law. And the moral law is universal. All times and all places. And Paul is clear on this. This is all times, all places. Okay? The second thing I want us to see about this as it pertains to homosexuality is that Paul places homosexual sin right beside a list of sins that you and I commit every single day. Paul places homosexual sin right beside a list of sins that you and I commit every single day. Verse 28. Um, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God... Who's they? Everyone. Everyone. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Verse 29, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness. Okay, covetousness. How many of you are never satisfied with what God's given you? Malice. Out to get other people. Um, Envy. You're always after what other people have. Murder. Where does murder come from according to Jesus? It comes from the heart. Okay? So full of hatred and jealousy towards other people. Strife. You, you stir that drama up. You get bored and you definitely need something to talk about. Uh, deceit. You, you, you're a liar. You tell falsehoods. You don't tell the truth. Maliciousness. It's not an accident. You, you're doing this stuff on purpose. Um, gossips. Do I, do I need to explain gossip? We, we got that one. Uh, that's one of the things the church avoids more than anything else, by the way. Um, slanderers, just bad-mouthing other people. Uh, haters of God. Insolent, you can't tell them anything. Haughty, they think they're so much better than everybody else. Boastful, and they want you to know it. Okay? They can't stop talking about themselves. Inventors of evil, we make up new ways to sin. Um, disobedient to parents. I'll leave that alone. Uh, Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree 
that, the, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, they give approval to those who practice them. In other words, we don't only rebel against God ourselves, we bring other people in to do it along with us. Now that's you and that's me. That's not just Hitler. Okay? Um, every day of our lives. So Paul's intent here is not just to go after those people. It's to come after all of humanity and make it very, very clear that we are all in the same boat here. That we are all living out in practice what's really going on in our hearts. And we have hearts that are inclined towards the worship of self, towards the worship of stuff, or towards the worship of some other God who is cool with us living however the heck we want. That's all of us. And that brings us to the third point I want us to see today. Paul clearly states that in light of our sin, God's people are not to have a judgmental attitude towards others. Paul clearly states in light of our sin that God's people are not to have a judgmental attitude towards others. How many of you are familiar with the the Westboro Baptist Church? Um, It's not a church, actually. It's a cult. It does not preach the gospel and uh, gives not only Baptists but Christians... Uh, a bad name. And this this so-called church, what they would do, if you're not familiar with them, what they would do is they would go around to, to any anything and everything that, that supposedly had sympathies towards the LGBT movement. Sometimes they would just go like to like military funerals and just show up there. Uh, just crazy, crazy kind of stuff. And they would protest. And they would hold up signs that say things like, God hates fags. And, and then they would cite Romans 1. <laughs> now, There's a real, real... It's almost comical, guys. Because there's a real irony that they they clearly have not read Romans chapter 2, verse 1. And Paul didn't... Paul wasn't the one, like, dividing this up into chapters. This thing just kept going, okay? Um, What does Romans chapter 1, verse 2 say? Therefore you... You have no excuse, O oh man, every one of you who judges for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Paul is essentially saying the same thing that Jesus says about this whole judging thing. All right, Now this command not to judge. Let's talk about that for a second. This command not to judge. Back in the day, it's been said that you know, John 3.16 was the verse that everybody, whether you're a Christian or not, knew. The verse everybody knows now is, is do not judge. That's what people are hearing, even if you're not a Christian. Do not judge. All right. What does that mean? All right. What was Jesus and Paul saying? What they were saying was, what were they saying that we're just like we're just supposed to sort of wander through life, unsure about right from wrong, just unsure about anything at all? No, absolutely not. I can tell you that for a couple of reasons. First of all, you can't live your life that way. Every single day, you're going to make decisions that are based upon value judgments, okay? About what you think is good, right, true, beautiful, whatever, okay? You're going to, you have to make assessments. You have to make judgments. Another reason I can tell you that that's not what they meant was because if, if, if that's the standard that we're saying, don't ever make any judgments, then Paul has just contradicted himself. He just he can't say Romans 1. It just kind of means... Yeah, Romans 2 said don't judge. Well, I just did. Like It makes no sense. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, He, he uses judgments like the next verse. Okay? This is not saying you can't make moral assessments. What it's saying is that you don't walk around haughty feeling as if you're better than anyone else. Because you are in the exact same boat with them. And guys, one of the things that drives me absolutely crazy is when I sit, see or talk to students who, who I know are, are struggling with porn, who are struggling with hookup culture, struggling with sexting, and they feel morally superior to those who are struggling with homosexuality. It's crazy. 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 One verse, I, I can't tell you where I got it. I'm sorry, not verse, quote that I heard years ago. It just stuck with me. Uh, and I hope it will stick with you. It was talking about a homosexual who was addressing a group of conservative Christians. And here's what he said. I wish that you, conservative Christians, felt as guilty over your sins as you expect me to feel about mine. 
I wish you would feel as guilty as you would say me for that. That, guys, guys, girl, we are in the same boat together. Okay? All of humanity. That's it. That, again, who's them? Who's them? Who's them? That's us. Okay? All of us are in desperate need of redemption here. And tomorrow, guys, we're going to talk about that good news. Okay? We're going to talk about the good news for all kinds of people who need Jesus. All right? Let's pray on that. Okay? Uh, God, I, I pray now that you would give us that sense of the depth of our own sin. Um, and you would save us from a judgmental attitude. Um, I pray that the church would embrace this as well. That we would see ourselves as needy, broken people um, who are in the same boat as people all over this planet. Uh, people who are desperately needing your, uh, of your salvation. Would that be the spirit in which we engage the world, uh, engage our friends, engage our communities? Keep us close to Jesus, we pray. All in His name. Amen. Text me if you have questions. Okay? I'll see you tomorrow.